The Ars Moriendi, or the art of death, um, became very important to Victorians by the mid to late 1800s. And within this, you had specific rules that one should follow in order to achieve a pious uh, death, not only for themselves, but also as a reflection on their families. First of all, the dying must uh, willingly accept that he is going to die, accept his fate. The second part of a good death was that as they were dying, it was important for one to either signify in writing or to someone who was standing around um, that they believed in God and they believed in their own salvation. The last portion of the good death, which I think is most uh, evident in the Civil War, especially through letters and through um, some of the different evidences that we have now from these soldiers, uh, is the leaving of a message or the leaving of some kind of a legacy to those back at home. The uh, person was considered to be at their most truthful at the point of death. So during the, the moments right before one passed away, the heart was at its truest. It's, it's very interesting to to notice that those last words, which we even think of today as being important to some degree, had much more resonance to people during the Victorian era. The concept of a good death also had a converse side. You had bad deaths or deaths that were not considered uh, holy or righteous. One example of a bad death would be a sudden death. Of course, in a wartime situation, that happens quite frequently. So the sudden death aspect um, is a very real and very scary thing to most of these soldiers. So much so that they took great pains to, uh, to prepare for this death, even when they weren't actually sitting in battle. Some of these soldiers would write letters home that would foretell their death and they would pin them to their uniforms and wear them into battle in case they happened to die suddenly. And if someone happened to find them on the battlefield and find that note, the soldier would then be achieving the good death. I think it's interesting to note that before and even after the American Civil War, about 85% of individuals died at home. Of course, as the Civil War came on, many of these soldiers were dying very far away from their homes. Uh, that brought a lot of uh, doctors and nurses into the picture, stepping in as surrogates, as mothers and as fathers, pretending to be family members for these soldiers on their deathbed, helping them, easing them into their fate. You saw them comforting them. You saw them also writing uh, condolence letters to their family members. The similarities in a lot of these condolence letters are very, very striking. In all of them, you see a very heavy patriotic element. You see the soldiers wanting to uh, portray themselves as very brave, very gallant, marching out willingly to accept their fate, to fight for God and country. Also within these condolence letters, you see those memorable last words, those words of love, those words of hope for the family that they left behind. One condolence letter that we have here in our collection that is a wonderful example um, of how this good death is portrayed um, was written by James Robert Montgomery. Dear Father, this is my last letter to you. I went into battle this evening as courier for General Heath. I have been struck by a piece of shell and my right shoulder is horribly mangled and I know death is inevitable. I am very weak, but I write to you because I know you would be delighted to read a word from your dying son. I know death is near, that I will die far from home and friends of my early youth, but I have friends here too who are kind to me. I pray my God to forgive my sins and feel that his promises are true, that he will forgive and save me. Give my love to all my friends. My strength fails me. My horse and my equipments will be left for you. Again, a long farewell to you. May we meet in heaven. Your dying son, J. R. Montgomery. Hundreds of thousands of civilians and soldiers died during the Civil War, but it fell to those who survived to make sense of what had happened and to honor the memory of the dead. They turned to time-honored traditions of mourning in order to accomplish this task. And it's a feature of every human society 
uh, for there to be a certain set of rules which, which, which the survivors of the dead are supposed to, to follow. And Americans in the 1860s were certainly no different. Uh, they had inherited most of their set of mourning practices from, from the English. Um, and it achieved its grandest form um, in terms of Queen Victoria, whose husband, Prince Albert, died the same year that the American Civil War began. Um, she popularized the wearing of black for many, many years, and black jewelry, hair jewelry, uh, things that became very much a staple of, 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 of traditional Victorian mourning practices. Mourning was a process which was meant to serve as an outward symbol of the gradual uplift out of great sadness. It relied on the use of visible symbols to accomplish this and were supposed to be used for, for very specific periods of time. Uh, women typically were in mourning for much longer periods than men, but there were all sorts of rules in terms of how long someone was supposed to mourn according to their direct relationship to the person who had passed away. Wives, for example, were supposed to mourn for about two years, whereas husbands were only supposed to be in mourning for about three months. The first stage of mourning was, was called heavy mourning or deep mourning and typically this involved wearing uh, black fabric with no shine or sheen to it, uh, typically a fabric that was known as black crepe. No jewelry was supposed to be worn at this period of time and, it, and if women were going out of doors they were supposed to cover their heads and their faces with veils. Um, they were not supposed to engage in any sort of social activities and, uh, and for widows this period of time lasted for, for about one year. Uh, after this period of time, she then entered what was known as half mourning, and at this time she could start to wear colors such as gray or mauve or lavender, maybe a little bit of white trim, uh, but she was still supposed to be very subdued and very much restricted in her social activities. Uh, children typically were able to wear white dresses with black or gray trim, um, and servants in a household might, might, might wear black armbands on their arm in order to signify a, a loss in their household. Jewelry, which could be worn in the half mourning period, typically included uh, black beads, which could be made of uh, jet or glass, um, and hair jewelry also became extremely popular at this time. Uh, hair jewelry could either be uh, mail ordered away, where, where you would send off locks of your loved one's hair and receive it back as a bracelet or, or um, as a brooch, um, or women could actually follow uh, various instructions which were published in different magazines and make it at home themselves. The trappings of mourning extended into other areas um, such as stationery. Uh, widows and widowers were supposed to be using paper that was edged in black. They also had half mourning stationery as well. Um, so there really was an entire industry that was built up around supplying people with, with the trappings in which to, to, to show these outward symbols of their grief.